Well, um, thank you for staying, and thank you for the invitation to come here and talk about a subject which is, uh, I would say, peripheral to ancient DNA, but as almost all ancient DNA work, of course, is dependent upon is it, uh, extracting the DNA from bone, the subject should be at least of peripheral interest to you. But I was inspired by what uh, Christina Gamba <coughs> presented on Sunday, and at the end of my talk, I'm going to try to relate to our new insights into bone structure with some sort of guesstimates or guesses about where, how this might relate to the petrous bone. So the person who did most of the work here is a former PhD student of uh, ours, of Ron Shachar and myself, Natalie Reznikov. Now, um, the field of bone structure research, I have to be careful in this audience about history, but the research is really literally more than 300 years old. And uh, <coughs> in the late 17th century, this microscope was used uh, by von Leeuwenhoek and, uh, and others to identify the structure, the lamella structure of bone, which is going to be the topic of my talk today. Uh, this microscope, um, this is an exact replica of the microscope, and it could magnify 400 times. And uh, at the same time, they, event they uh, identified Haversian canals and so on. And much of the research on bone structure, if you follow it back historically, parallels the developments of technology. And uh, it's absolutely, I mean, this correlation is very, very clear. And it's reflected in this talk, as I'm going to talk about results that we obtained using what's called the dual beam, uh, focused ion beam SEM. <coughs> it's an, a microscope which uh, can cut your sample and image the sample. So. Um, this is a technology which um, has just been around in this application form for the last few years. Now, the only way to sort of make some sense out of the structure of bone is to first of all realize there is no such thing as the structure of bone. You have to understand it in terms of hierarchical levels of organization. And uh, by that I mean if you start at level one, and these are the components of bone. So the, the, the crystals and the collagen. And then you go to the building block of bone, which in this particular scheme, which uh, we published in 1998, I called the mineralized collagen fibril. Now you take those fibrils and you put them together in some sort of organizational motif and you go up in scale to the next level. And then you take these arrays of collagen fibrils and you start organizing them into different motifs and you get to this level and so on and so forth until you get up seven levels to the bone itself. So that's what we mean by the hierarchical structure of bone. And I'm going to be talking a lot about the organization of these arrays of collagen fibrils. <coughs> now, this structure of the lamella bone structure, I choose lamella bone because I don't know what percent exactly, but it's certainly more than 80% of all bone is lamella bone. Um, and so, for all intents and purposes, almost all bone that you study, but not all bone, but almost all bone, is lamella bone. So that's what we're interested in. And there have been many models and many investigations. Uh, this is a very one that's still extremely relevant, where you get a twisted plywood model, and I'll explain. Um, this is a model which we presented uh, 10 years after this one, and this is another more recent model. And all these models, and I emphasize their models because they're interpretations of sort of little glimpses of the structure in different, collected in different ways, relate to how the organization of the collagen fibrils varies in three dimensions. But when I at least try to advance on the insights that I gained here using the technologies that were available then and, and that followed, I got stuck. So basically I backed off from the subject until Natalie Reznikov came along and said maybe we can advance the subject using um, uh, this following method. Basically, what we are able to do in principle is to take a volume about 10 by 10 microns and slice it like you're slicing a slice of bread into slices 10 nanometers thick. Okay, so that's the resolution. We set the magnification so that we have a magnification in each of our images of 10 nanometers. And in the Z direction, it's also 10 nanometers. So that's we get need about 1,000 images to fill a volume of 10 by 10 by 10 microns. And so we can, and we can do this. 
Now, what's involved? Unfortunately, we can't image uh, this, do these experiments with mineral present because there's just no contrast in this microscope at the moment. So you have to remove the mineral phase and you fix and stain, but you use a lot of modern techniques, high, pre sorry, high pressure freezing, free substitution, and then embedded in a plastic in order to maintain the structure. If you just dry or distort the structure, then of course you're lost. And um, then you use the dual beam microscope to make the slices and you repeat this a thousand times and then you align it into a stack. And then you can analyze a stack <coughs> And uh, if some of you know um, tilt tomography, there the resolution, or in confocal microscopy, the resolution in the XY is often very different from the resolution in the third direction. Here the resolution is the same in all directions, which makes interpretation very uh, much more easy, much easier. Now, one image of the thousand <coughs> would look like this. What you can see here is the characteristic banding pattern of collagen. This is a magnified version, and that tells you the direction of the collagen fibrils. So this unit here is a bunch of collagen fibrils oriented with their long axes in these directions. Now the movie that I'm going to show you at the moment is going to go through, and you'll see how these orientations change systematically. And this is the plywood structure, which was first identified 100 years ago by Gebhardt. It's well known, and that's what when people said this is the structure of the bone at this hierarchical level, that's what they had in mind. However, right even from the first picture here, you can ask, well, what are these thin layers doing here? And you're going to see them all the time. And then you're going to see in the video that when the ch when just as the direction changes, all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose and there's no order. Something that's never been seen before, and then the order comes back. Okay, so let me show you the... Uh, the movie, and then we'll talk about Okay, so this is now going through the whole stack and you can see there's the disorder, sort of chaos and then it changed direction, it's now in this direction, you can see these thin layers chaos and then you can start seeing that it's now flipped back to being more or less horizontal so you have this direction, this direction, and when it changes there's chaos and, you, and now you're looking end on. You can also see that these collagen fibrils that are in arrays are actually arranged in bundles, which was another aspect of the structure which was not recognized before. And then we can turn it around. You see these thin layers here also are very disorganized material. Um, you can see the different orientations uh, in this view. And here are the canaliculi. Uh, going through the structure. They're flowing because they're at an angle and you're going and you're slicing down the slices. So this is um, really a huge amount of data that tells you about the structure of bone and what's new in all this analysis is this chaotic bone which we called a disordered material. So in three dimensions you would see uh, you take just three slices orthogonal and you'll see these thin layers between the, the ordered layers. You can see the bundles. And um, well, in, th in this three dimensions, you don't see the chaotic layers that easily. But this is an example in the static view of that chaotic layer. And here the collagen are pr is present as single fibrils. They're not arranged in bundles. And there's a lot of ground mass or space between them, which looks like it's filled with proteoglycans. Unfortunately, we don't know much about the minerals, the crystals inside here, which is, would be very important, but that uh, is for future work. So these are the three different motifs. High angle, this is human bone, by the way. High angle, disordered, and low angle. And that's the plywood type of structure. So when you model this, and you sort of try to put this all into three dimensions, the green cylinders are the bundles of aligned collagen fibrils. The blue is the disordered material. And the disordered material basically envelops individual bundles. And when you change direction, then the disordered material fills in the, uh, as a layer across the sort of the, the mismatch, so to speak. And then you change direction 
and you have, again, only ordered and disordered material. So this is, on this basis, we, we claim that bone um, is really composed of two different materials, one of which we've known about for 100 years, and one of which is discovered in this type of work. So, of course, it's all three-dimensional, so you can see, for example, sometimes you go through the structure and all the fibrils are arranged in one direction for a long period of time, and that would be similar to, for example, tendon, or many fish bones and so on, are arranged like that. In other cases, the, the, the collagen fibrils do not change discreetly, like I just showed, but they, they change in, dis in small steps, and you have this fanning motif. So there are all sorts of motifs inside there. But the last, one of the powerful thing, aspects of this technology is that you can use fast Fourier transform to quantitatively define how well aligned the collagen fibrils are and in which direction. So now you don't have to eyeball this thing and say it's in that direction. You can plot the directions or the mean direction and the angular dispersion. So as soon as it becomes chaotic, you see from the fast Fourier transform what's going on. And this opens up the way to really address in a quantitative way questions which are very interesting. For example, adaptation to functional use. For example, this famous right arm of the tennis player or different modes of, uh, of behavior that, or, or disability that causes a bone to adjust to the way the mechanical stresses are applied to that bone. Up to now, it sort of says, you, it looks like it might be different, and now you can actually address this quantitatively. But the most important, this is how you would do it and plot it for each image and so on. However, what about the embedded cellular network inside bone? And these, of course, are the osteocyte lacunae. This is where the cells are. And this, of course, is where the DNA is initially located. So we have no other reason to believe that DNA is infiltrating from any other tissue at this stage. Maybe it's wrong, but that's the, the most reasonable assumption. But these osteocyte lacunae send out myriads of capillaries or canaliculi. And uh, a colleague of ours, Peter Fratzel, in his grab in, bon in, in, in Berlin, sorry, has said that there is not more than, I think, one or two microns distance in a bone between neighboring canaliculi. So these things are pervasive, and this is a study by a former student of his, um, Kirschnitzky, showing the distribution of these canaliculi, and these are the osteocyte lacunae, uh, but they're seen better here in histology. So if we're going to think about where the DNA is, I would first start looking about talking about this uh, um, embedded cellular network. Well, the three-dimensional structural analysis gives us a very interesting clue because the bottom line of what I'm going to show you now is that the, the whole canaliculi network and the osteocyte network is embedded totally in the disordered material and not in the ordered material. In this particular movie, you'll see that the um, canaliculi take on a good, st uh, high, a heavy stain. This is the disordered material that surrounds each canaliculus, and then we're going to can follow them in three dimensions. So, and have a, and you'll see for yourself that they are always embedded in these disordered thin layers when you have aligned collagen fibrils. And when it's changed direction, then the canaliculi also change direction, and they can go in a totally different line, different direction. So there's the chaotic, um, the disordered material. Now we're putting this together. You can join the dots, so to speak. And then you can see from the side the, the, the motion or the, or the directions of the canaliculi. Here are the, the bundles look to seen edge on, and the canaliculi flowing th between the bundles. They're just snaking between the bundles everywhere. And then you do surface rendering, and there's part of an osteocyte lacuna. These are individual canaliculi at this particular resolution, um, and, and so on. You can, and you can see the whole structure. So where's our DNA, your DNA? Should be 
most likely somewhere associated with this or penetrated into the bone that's adjacent to this material. So the this, this cellular network is embedded in the disordered material. And forget about ancient DNA, or put aside, not forget, God forbid, we won't forget. Um, set aside that for a moment, but um, there's a lot of talk about mechanosensing. That how does the bone know how you're using it and what sort of movement? And everybody assumes that it's the osteocytes themselves with their cell processes in the canaliculi that are doing the mechanosensing. There's no 100% proof of this, in my opinion. Uh, but there are those cell processes are going to be feeling the disordered material. So the mechanical properties of that disordered material, I think, are going to be key to understanding uh, mechanosensing. The whole issue of mineral, mineral homeostasis, a few percent of the, uh, by, we by volume, weight, or whatever, of the mineral in bone is recycled all the time. If you're losing calcium for whatever reason, you take a little bit out of your bone. If you have excess <coughs> calcium, you put it back. And that fast recycling component is also obviously going to be related directly to this uh, disordered material, um, as that's where the cells have access to the adjacent bone. So we need to put this all back together now and create a new hierarchical scheme because we've changed the whole picture. So uh, in contrast to what we had before um, from 1990, whatever, eight, we have to think at least in the, in, the, in the lower levels of hierarchical organization about the two materials. And these are sort of the borders of these pictures are shown in different colors. The ordered material is, in, is uh, levels are in green and the disordered in brown. So up to this level, basically, you can say when you're talking of up to the sort of the level of the osteocyte lacunae, there's the bone is composed of two materials, but then you get up to higher length scales. And of course, at those length scales, you're now considering both materials together and we have this sort of graded pattern. Now, um, that's, I think, as, as the state of the art in terms of understanding the three-dimensional hierarchical organization of, um, of bone. Sorry. Now, thinking about Christina Gamba's talk, this sort of got me, got me going a little bit because what the message is that basically there's a bone out there, the Petrus bone, that has 10 times, or I can't remember, or 20 times better preserved DNA. And I've been working in this field also, by the way, with ancient DNA for quite a long time um, in, 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 in Israel. And the challenge here is to find well-preserved DNA. I mean, you can survey bone after bone after bone after bone, and it's a huge amount of work, and find no, no bones that are relevant or a few bones. And I think you heard uh, some talks about that. And so if we had an effective pre-screening technique that would be able to be relatively rapid but could identify bones that had a higher chance of, of having a, a, a DNA, that would be fantastic. And therefore, is this Petrus bone giving us a clue? We don't always didn't necessarily have to go to the Petrus bone, but if we knew what's going on there, we could say, are there other bones like that which uh, we could apply this to? Now, um, what um, Christina mentioned was that, well, first of all, th at the hierarchical level of DNA itself, we're down here. This is just one of the components of a bone. At the level of organization of where we're likely to find it, it should be at the level of the osteocyte lacuna and the canalicular system. And afterwards, if things are all chaotic and all these little pieces of DNA are going through and permeating, then of course we, can, we might find it everywhere. But let's go one step at a time. Now, Christina mentioned this term what is special about the Petrus bone is bone mineral density. That's what's reported. Now, it is incredibly confusing, these terms, and I had to remind myself what exactly they meant, and Christina sent me a paper where th that she was referring to. And bone mineral density, as I understand it, is the amount of bone in a given volume of bone as measured by micro-CT. Now, micro-CT, the way they were doing it, doesn't have a resolution that comes anywhere close to the canaliculi. Um, you can do that. In my, we have a micro CT at the Weizmann Institute that can, can image canaliculi, but this doesn't include that. Bone mineral density is, a, is 
is at this level of hierarchical organization. But we're asking a question about the preservation of <coughs> molecules down here and relating it to something up here. And I don't see the connection uh, directly. I don't think it's due to uh, any bone that has low bone mineral density um, is not necessarily going to have more DNA. It's not because the, the water flux through a bone like that is restricted at that level. We're dealing with orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude difference. So what is going on then? Well, um, my p I focus in <coughs> over here on this, on this level of hierarchical organization. And here are the canaliculi at lower magnification. And at high magnification, this is what they look like. And according to the three-dimensional analysis, the, these are all embedded in the disordered material. So it should be in this zone, which just surrounds the canaliculi, that I would be looking for ancient DNA, if it has, in fact, left the, the lacuna themselves. So now, at least, what I would say is we have, we have a, a road map. We can ask a specific question and think about the technique and say, well, could we find a DNA imprint over there? I would choose spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, or something like that, uh, to ask that question. Very, Raman is bedeviled by the fact that it has very high, anything that was buried in the ground fluoresces like crazy, and Raman can't be used simply. But we would need to think of something along those lines. Finally, I found this paper from 1984 about the Petrus bone. And in the abstract, it says the collagen fibers in the labyrinthine capsule, which is the core of this sort of fist-like looking object, are arranged in an irregular web-like pattern, whereas in the outer periosteal layer, they run predominantly parallel to the surfaces of the petrous bone, probably to minimize the mechanical stress. This web-like pattern is reminiscent in my mind of, at, of the disordered material. The collagen fibrils in this disordered material are not in bundles as would be picked up here um, by these at, in terms of the outer layer. The outer layer sounds like regular organization of, of bone, and this stuff sounds like something else completely. Now, I know in the literature there's a term woven bone, and that's a catch-all for, I don't know what the hell's going on, we call it woven bone. And so there's been a lot of sort of not so serious debate because you don't have much to, to go on uh, that compares this type of woven bone to that and to that and to that. And I think uh, um, my guess would be that maybe we're dealing here with a bone which for one, whatever reason or another has a huge proportion of this disordered material. So in conclusion, bone contains two different materials, the ordered bundles of aligned collagen fibril arrays the disordered fibrils with much ground mass between them. The cellular network is embedded inside the disordered material, and this provides us now with a new framework for understanding or thinking about material properties, fine-tuning of structure, mechanosensing, and maybe even where the DNA is located in fossil bone. Thank you. But, you know, yeah, but hard, hardness doesn't relate. I mean, hardness is at the level of the crystals and the proportions of the components. So I don't think that's going to protect the bone as such. It's the, it's the porous system that goes through. You have to ask the question, do bacteria get through the canaliculi system? Or are they, can they get just to the lacuna or, or whatever? They're in fact, themselves. 
Yeah. So there, yeah. So anyway, that's the way I would try to sort of diagnose the problem, really. I don't know the answer. Yeah. Well, the subject of water in bone is itself a whole world. There are about five different types of water in bone. There's structural water, there's water on surfaces of crystals, there's water in the collagen fibrils, there's water in the canalicula, when, and only then does it start becoming liquid water, and in the blood vessel system. So, um, and bacterial access is a very different problem, is a different process, because even if a bacterium might be, say, two microns, and it can't penetrate a canalicula, it can still processes in uh, or and molecules like, you know, for foraging and then in the harvest. So I don't know what stops, at what level bacteria can be stopped in a sense in this, in this scheme of things. Maybe somebody else does. Well, they can't because uh, one of the things you see is what's known as pre-agonal bacteremia. Just before you die, your immune system lets go and your body is invaded by the bugs in your gut. They can travel up the blood vessels of the bone and into the canaliculi while the patient is just dying. Okay. So by the time they're dead, bacteria are already there. Okay, there's an answer. Is the skull structure the same as the bone structure? Yeah, there's and also the trabecular bone. It's, uh, it's a myth amongst people who work with that trabecular bone has a higher surface area that can be exposed to the environment. It's, uh, it's not, uh, as again, you have to think about the hierarchical levels. It's uh, obviously, it's a lot easier, more difficult to clean trabecular bone uh, and so on. But um, no, I don't, I mean, I don't know which bones are, I mean, we've just discovered this. I don't know where there's more of this disordered bone material. And this petrous bone, I mean, I'm fascinated by this. I've known, I've, been, I've analyzed myself dense bones the tympanic bulla of the whale, and, and, and it has very little collagen, by the way, but the crystals grow in. I thought it was a totally different problem. Maybe there's a clue there. Yeah, well, we did, we started it in, um, in uh, rat bone, and the disordered material is there, but, but you don't have, it's not necessarily continuous as it is in human bone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in horse bone, and there's a fascinating structure in fish bone, where, where the one that we studied in this way, where the collagen fibrils basically are rotating spirally, and every 180 degrees there's a thin layer of disordered material, and then they just continue rotating, and then another 180 degrees, and there's a thin layer of disordered material. That's why if you make a section of, thin of fish bone, it looks the same in every direction, something which has puzzled everybody. Um, so, no, so I think in every bone we've looked at so far, um, there is this disordered material. In human bone, it's about between 10 and 20 percent, as we estimated by the volume of the bone. So there might be another human bone which has 50 percent, I don't know. Um, Ordered, the other one is not ordered, right? Mm. So would you see a way to mechanically enrich for one over the other, perhaps, during the uh, extraction or destruction of the bone? To mechan to mechan enrich, enrich. Yeah, enrich on one over the other. Um, well, while well the mineral is still in there. Yeah, I don't know. No, I've never I, I, I think we just don't know enough about, about it. There are people who grind up bone into, but then again, the particle sizes, is, you know, you have to think now about the scale. So you can, diff you know, I don't know the answer to that. Have you just tested this to see if it changes with age of the uh, person? No, but... Um, Worth doing. <laughs> yeah, we're... Well, I'm getting older. I know, so am I. So are we all, even. So, so are my grandchildren. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you.